Hello everyone, welcome to SiliconANGLE news breaking story here. Amazon Web Services expanding their relationship with Hugging Face. Uh, breaking news here on SiliconANGLE. I'm John Furrier, SiliconANGLE reporter, founder, and also co-host of theCUBE. And I have with me Swami from Amazon Web Services, Vice President of Database Analytics Machine Learning with AWS. Swami, great to have you on for this breaking news segment on AWS's big news. Thanks for coming on and taking the time. Hey John, pleasure to be here. I'm you know, really looking. we've had many conversations on theCUBE over the years. We've watched Amazon really move fast into the large data modeling. You, SageMaker became a very smashing success. Obviously you've been on this for a while. Now with ChatGPT, OpenAI, a lot of buzz going mainstream, takes it from behind the curtain, inside the ropes, if you will, in the industry to a mainstream. And so this is a big moment, I think, in the industry. I want to get your perspective because your news with Hugging Face, I think, is a is another tell sign that we're about to tip over into a new accelerated growth around making AI now application aware, application centric, more programmable, more API access. What's the big news about with AWS Hugging Face? You know, what's going on with this announcement? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, we are very excited to announce our expanded uh, collaboration with Hugging Face uh, because with this partnership, uh, our goal, as you all know, I mean, uh, Hugging Face, I consider them like the uh, GitHub for machine learning. And uh, uh, with this partnership, Hugging Face and AWS uh, will be able to democratize AI for a broad range of developers, not just specific uh, deep AI uh, startups. And now uh, with this, we can accelerate the training, fine tuning and deployment of these large language models and uh, vision models uh, from Hugging Face in the cloud. Uh, so, and uh, uh, the uh, broader context when you step back and see what customer problem we are trying to solve with this announcement. Essentially, if you see these foundational models uh, are used to now create like a huge number of uh, applications uh, such as like text summarization, question answering or search, image generation, creative, uh, other things. And um, these are all stuff we are seeing in the likes of these chat GPT style applications, but there is a broad range of enterprise use cases that we don't even talk about. And uh, it's because these kind of transformative generative AI capabilities and models are not uh, available to, I mean, millions of developers. And um, because either training these LLMs from scratch can be very expensive or time consuming and need deep expertise, or more importantly, they don't need these generic models. They need them to be fine tuned for the specific use cases. Uh, and one of the biggest complaints we hear is that uh, these models, uh, when they try to use it for real production use cases, they are incredibly expensive to train and incredibly expensive to run in front on, uh, to use it at a production scale. So, and unlike search, uh, web search style applications where the margins can be really huge, um, here in production use cases and enterprises, you want efficiency at scale. That's where Hugging Face and AWS share our mission. And by integrating with uh, Trainium and Inferentia, we're able to handle the cost efficient uh, training and inference at scale. I'll deep dive on it. And by training, uh, teaming up on the SageMaker front, now the time it takes to build these models and fine tune them is also coming down. So that's what makes this partnership very unique uh, as well, so and very exciting. I want to get into the to the uh, time savings and the cost savings as well on the on the training and inference. It's a huge issue. But before we get into that, just how long have you guys been working with Hugging Face? I know there's a previous relationship. This is an expansion of that relationship. Can you comment on the what's different about what's happened before and then now? Yeah, so uh, Hugging Face, we have had a uh, great relationship in the past uh, few years uh, as well, where they have actually made their models uh, available uh, to run on AWS in a fashion. Even in fact, uh, their Bloom project uh, was something many of our customers even used. Uh, Bloom project for context is their open source project, uh, which builds a GPT-3 style uh, model. And uh, now with this expanded collaboration, now Hugging Face uh, selected uh, AWS for the next generation of its generative AI model, uh, building on their highly successful Bloom project as well. And the nice thing is um, 
now by direct integration with Trainium and Inferentia, where you get uh, cost savings in a really uh, significant way. Uh, now, now, for instance, TR on one uh, can provide up to 50% cost to train savings and Inferentia can deliver up to 60% better costs and uh, 4X uh, more uh, higher throughput and or now, now these models, especially as they train their next generation uh, generative AI models, it is going to be not only more accessible to <laughs> all the developers who use it and open, so it'll be a lot cheaper uh, as well. And that's what uh, makes this moment really exciting because yeah. we can't democratize AI unless we make it uh, broadly accessible and cost efficient and uh, easy to program and use as well. So yeah, I'll get, stage, I'll get into the stage maker and code whisperer. Uh, angle in a second, but you hit on some good points there. One, accessibility, which is, I call it the democratization, which is getting this in the hands of developers and or, uh, <laughs> or AI to develop. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. So access to coding and, and get reasoning is a whole nother wave. But the three things I know you've been working on, I want to you put in the buckets here and comment. One, I know you've got, over the years been working on saving time to train. That's a big point. You mentioned some of those stats. Also costs, because now cost is an equation on you know, bundling, whether you're un uncoupling with hardware and software, that's a, a, a big issue. Where do I find the GPUs? Where's the horsepower cost? And then also sustainability. You've mentioned that in the past. Is there a sustainability angle here? Can you talk about those three things? Uh, um, time, cost, and um, sustainability. Totally. So uh, if you look at it uh, from the AWS perspective, we have been supporting customers uh, doing machine learning uh, for the past years. Uh, just for broader context, Amazon has been uh, doing ML uh, for the past two decades, uh, right from the early days of ML powered recommendation to actually also supporting all kinds of uh, uh, generative AI applications. Uh, if you look at even uh, generative AI application within Amazon, uh, Amazon search, when you go search for a product and, uh, and so forth, uh, you have a team called uh, M5 within Amazon search that uh, helps bring these large language models uh, into creating highly accurate search results. Uh, and these are created with models with uh, really large models with tens of billions of parameters, scales to thousands of training jobs uh, every month and uh, uh, trained on uh, large uh, model hardware. And uh, this is an example of a really good large language foundational model application running at production scale. And also, of course, Alexa, which uses uh, uh, and uh, large generative uh, model as well. And uh, they actually even had a research paper that showed uh, that they are more in, uh, do better in accuracy than uh, other uh, systems um, uh, like GPT-3 and whatnot. So, and we also touched on things like Code Whisperer, uh, where which uses uh, generative AI to improve developer productivity, but in a responsible manner, because 40% of uh, some of the studies showed 40% of these generated code had serious security flaws in it. This is where we didn't just do generative AI, we combined with automated reasoning uh, capabilities, which is a very, very useful technique to uh, identify these issues and couple them so that uh, it produces highly uh, secure code as well. Now, all these learnings taught us few things, and uh, which is what you put in these three buckets. Uh, and yeah, like more than 100,000 customers using ML and AI services, including leading startups in the generative AI space like Stability AI, AI21 Labs, or Hugging Face, or even Alexa, uh, uh, for that matter, they care about, uh, I put them in three dimensions. One is around cost, which we touched on with Trainium and Inferentia, where we actually, with Trainium, you provide to 50% better cost savings. But the other aspect is Trainium is a lot more power efficient as well compared to traditional yeah. uh, one. Um, and Inferentia is also better in terms of throughput. Uh, when it comes to what it is capable of, like it is able to deliver up to 3x higher compute performance and 4x higher throughput uh, 
but it's previous generation and it is uh, extremely cost efficient and power efficient as well. Well, now the second uh, element uh, that really is important is uh, end of the day, developers deeply value the time uh, it takes to build these models, and uh, they don't want to build models from scratch. And this is where SageMaker, which is uh, even going to Kaggle uses, is what it is number one enterprise ML platform. What it did to traditional machine learning, uh, where tens of thousands of customers uh, use SageMaker today, including the ones I mentioned, is that what used to take like months to build these models have dropped down to now a matter of days, if not less. Now with generative AI, uh, the cost of building these models, if you look at the landscape, the model parameter size have jumped by more than 1000X in the past three years. 1,000x. Um, and that means the training uh, is like a really big distributed systems problem. How do you actually scale these model training? How do you actually ensure that you utilize these um, efficiently? Because these machines are very expensive, let alone they consume a lot of power. So this is a SageMaker capability to build, automatically train, tune, and deploy models really comes in handy, especially with this distributed training infrastructure. And those are some of the reasons why some of the leading generative AI startups are actually leveraging it because they do not want a giant infrastructure team, which is constantly tuning and fine tuning and keeping these clusters alive. It sounds like and, a lot like, uh, sounds like a lot like what startups were doing with the cloud early days. No data center, <laughs> you move to the cloud. So this is the trend we're seeing, right? You guys are making it easier for developers with hugging face. I get that, I love that GitHub for, for machine learning. Large language models are complex and expensive to build, but not anymore, you got training and inferentia. Developers can get faster time to, to value, but then you got the transformers, data sets, token libraries, all that optimized for generating. This is a perfect storm for startups. John Truro, former AWS uh, person who used to work, I think for you, is now a VC at Madrona Ventures. He and I were talking about the generative AI landscape. It's exploding with startups. Every alpha entrepreneur out there is seeing this as the next frontier. That's the 20 mile stair is going to next 10 years is going to be huge. What is the big thing that's happening? Because some people are saying the founder of Y Combinator said, oh, the startups won't be real because they don't all have AI experience. Uh, John Markoff, former New York Times writer told me that AI, there's so much work done. This is going to explode, accelerate really fast because it's almost like it's been waiting for this moment. What's your reaction? Uh, I actually think there is going to be an explosion of startups, uh, 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 not because they need to be AI startups, but now finally AI is uh, really accessible or going to be accessible so that they can create remarkable applications uh, either for enterprises or for disrupting uh, actually how customer uh, service is being done or uh, how creative uh, uh, tools are being built. And uh, I mean, this is going to change in many ways. When we think about generative AI, we always uh, uh, like to think of how it generates uh, like uh, school homework or arts or music or whatnot. But uh, when you look at it on the practical side, generative AI is being actually used across various industries. Uh, I'll give an example of uh, like Autodesk. Uh, Autodesk is a customer who runs in, uh, AWS and SageMaker. They already have an offering that enables generative design where designers can generate many structural designs for products where you give a specific set of constraints and they actually can generate uh, a structure accordingly. And uh, we see similar kind of trend across various industries where it can be around creative uh, media editing or various others. Uh, I had this strong sense that uh, literally in the next few years, uh, just like now, conventional machine learning is embedded in every application. Uh, every mobile app that we see, uh, it is uh, pervasive and we don't even think twice about it. Same way, yeah. like almost uh, all apps are built on cloud. Generative AI is going to be uh, part of uh, every startup and they are going to create our, uh, remarkable experiences without needing actually these deep uh, generative AI scientists. And uh, but you won't get there until you actually make these models accessible. And I have 
I also don't think one model is going to rule the world, then you want these uh, developers uh, to have access to broad range of models. Uh, just like go back to the early days of uh, deep learning. Everybody thought it is going to be one framework that will rule the world. And it has been changing from Cafe to TensorFlow to PyTorch to yeah. various other things. And I have a suspicion we had to enable developers where they are. So You know, Dave, well. Dave Alante and I have been riffing on this concept called super cloud and a lot of people have co-opted to be multi-cloud, but we really were getting at this whole next layer on top of say AWS. You guys are the most comprehensive cloud. You guys are a super cloud. And even Adam and I are talking about ISVs involving to ecosystem partners. I mean, your top customers have ecosystems building on top of it. This feels like a whole nother AWS. How are you guys leveraging the, the history of AWS, which by the way, had the same trajectory. Startups came in, they didn't want to provision a data center, the heavy lifting. All the things that have made Amazon successful culturally and day one thinking is reduce the heavy, provide the heavy lifting, undifferentiated heavy lifting and make it faster for developers to program code. AI's got the yeah. same thing. How are you guys taking this to the next level? Because now this is an opportunity for the competition to change the game and take it over. This is, I'm sure a conversation. You guys have a lot of things going on in AWS that makes you unique. What's the internal and external positioning around how you take it to the next level? I mean, uh, so I uh, agree with you that generative AI has a very, very uh, strong potential in terms of uh, what it can enable in terms of next generation application. Uh, but uh, this is where uh, Amazon's uh, experience and expertise and uh, putting these uh, foundation models to work internally really uh, has uh, helped us quite a bit. If you look at it, uh, like Amazon.com search is like a very, very important application in terms of what is the customer impact on the uh, number of customers who use that application openly uh, and number of, uh, and the amount of dollar impact it does for an uh, organization. Uh, and uh, we have been doing it silently for a while now. And uh, the same thing is true for like Alexa too, which actually not only uses it for, uh, natural language understanding others, it even actually leverages it for creating stories and various uh, other uh, examples. And um, now our uh, uh, approach to it from AWS is, uh, we actually look at it as uh, in terms of uh, the same three tiers like we did in machine learning, because uh, when you look at generative AI, there are, uh, we genuinely see three sets of uh, customers. One is like really deep, technical expert uh, practitioner startups. These are the startups that are creating the next generation models like the likes of Stability AI, so uh, Hugging Face with Bloom or AI21. And they generally want to build their own models and they want the best price performance uh, of uh, their infrastructure for training and inference. That's where our investments in silicon and uh, hardware and uh, networking innovations where Trainium and Inferentia really plays a break role. And we will continue to do that, and that is a one. A second middle tier is uh, where I do think um, developers don't want to spend time uh, building their own models, let alone they actually want the model to be useful to that data. They need, they don't need the, their models to create like uh, high school homeworks or various other things. What they generally want is, yeah, I have this data from my enterprises that I want to fine tune and make it really work only for this and make it work remarkable. It can be for text summarization to generate a report or it can be for better Q&A and so forth. This is where we are, uh, our investments in the middle tier with SageMaker and uh, our partnership with uh, Hugging Face and AI21 and Cohere are all going to be very meaningful. And you'll see us investing, I mean, you already talked about Code Whisperer, yeah. uh, which is an open preview, but we are also partnering with a whole lot of uh, uh, top uh, ISVs, uh, and you'll see more on this front uh, to enable the next wave of generative AI apps too, because this is an area where we do think a uh, lot of innovation is yet to be done. It's like day one for us uh, in this space, and we want to enable that uh, huge uh, app ecosystem to flourish. You know, one of the things David Volante and I were talking about in our first podcast we just did um, uh, on Friday, we're going to do weekly, 
is we highlighted the AI chat GPT example as a horizontal use case because everyone loves it. Every, people are using it in all their different verticals and horizontal scalable cloud plays perfectly into it. So I have to ask you, as you look at what AWS is gonna, going to bring to the table, a lot's changed over the past 13 years with AWS. A lot more services are available. How should someone rebuild their, or refact, or replatform and refactor their application or business with AI with AWS? What are some of the tools that you see and recommend? Is it serverless? Is it SageMaker, Code Whisper? What do you think is going to shine brightly within the AWS um, stack, if you will, or service list that's going to be part of this? As you mentioned, Code Whisper and SageMaker. What else? Uh, should people be looking at as they start tinkering and, and getting all these benefits and, and scale up their apps? Yeah, uh, if I were a startup first, uh, I would really work backwards from the customer problem I try to solve and uh, pick and choose uh, where I don't need to deal with the undifferentiated uh, heavy lifting. So, and that's where the answer is going to change. Uh, if you look at it, uh, the answer is uh, not going to be like a one size uh, fits all. So uh, you need a very strong, uh, I mean, uh, granted on the compute front, if you can actually completely architect it, so unless I will always recommend it uh, instead of running compute for running your apps because it takes care of all the undifferentiated heavy lifting. But on the data end, uh, that's where we provide a uh, whole variety of databases, uh, right from like relational with uh, Aurora to non-relational with Dynamo and so forth. And uh, of course, we also uh, have a deep analytical stack uh, where data directly flows in from our relational databases into data lakes and data warehouse. And uh, you can get value along with partnership with uh, various analytical providers. Um, the area where uh, I do think uh, fundamentally things are changing on what people can do is like with Code Whisperer, I was literally trying to actually program a code on uh, sending uh, a message through Twilio and I was going to pull up to read a documentation and in my ID, uh, I was actually saying like, well, let's try sending a message to Twilio or let's actually update uh, Route 53A record. All I had to do was type in just a comment and it actually started generating the subroutine. And uh, it is going to be a huge time saver if I were a developer. And the goal is for us not to actually do it just for AWS developers and not to just generate the code, but make sure the code is actually highly secure and uh, follows the best practices. So it's not always about machine learning, it's augmenting with automated reasoning as well. And um, generative AI is going to be changing and uh, not just in how people write code, but also how it actually gets built and used as well. You'll see a lot more stuff coming on well, this front. Swami, I thank this, you uh, for your time. I know you're super busy. Thank you for sharing on the news and giving commentary. Again, I think this is a AWS moment and industry moment, heavy lifting, accelerated value, agility. Um, AI ops is going to be probably redefined here. And thanks for sharing your commentary and we'll see you next time. And looking forward to, to doing more follow up on this. It's going to be a big wave. Thanks. Yeah, thanks again, John. Always a pleasure. Okay. This is Silicon right. Angle's breaking news commentary. I'm John Furrier with Silicon Angle News as well as host of theCUBE. Swami, who's a leader in AWS has been on theCUBE multiple times. We've been tracking the growth of how Amazon's journey has been exploding past five years, in particular past three, you heard the numbers, great performance, great reviews. This is a, a watershed moment, I think for the industry and it's going to be a lot of fun for the next 10 years. Thanks for watching.